Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad that you're here today. Thank you for coming and joining together as we come to worship the Lord. If you are watching or listening to us online, we welcome you also. Glad you've joined us. I wish you were here. We miss you, but we're glad that you're a part of us this morning. I'm Pastor Steve, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about our church. A mission statement of our church is to introduce people to Jesus and then to help those who know him to become like him. And we're trying to accomplish this mission through a vision of worship, nurture, and outreach. And again, we are glad that you're here today. Just a couple things to uh, let you know. During our worship service, we do not have a time where we take an offering, but you can give to our church uh, if you would like to. There's a, an offering box out on the table in the foyer if you would like to, uh, to give. Or if you'd like to give online, if you go to our church webpage, there will be information there on how you can give. And again, I want to thank you so much for your financial support of our church and the ministry here. We're very, very grateful to you. We do have a couple of announcements, and I'm going to ask if uh, Kristen Jackson, our chairman of trustees, will come and make, make one. Thanks. Um, yes, I'm Kristen Jackson, Chair of the Trustees, and I just have a few quick announcements. One, I know this is really last-minute notice, but we have a few tasks that have come up that the trustees uh, would like to have a little mini work day this coming Saturday. We'll try to get an email out um, tomorrow, but um, just from 9 to noon on Saturday, uh, a number of the light bulbs in these lower-hanging chandeliers are out in the sanctuary, as well as some other fluorescent bulbs. We'd also like to put Bibles back in the pew backs. Um, and uh, we also want to go through some of the cabinets in the Sunday school classrooms that have stuff that has not been used for years. We want to sort of declutter and clean through those. So um, again, this is this Saturday from 9 to noon. If you're able to lend a hand and help out, um, we'd appreciate it. Thank you very much. And um, while I'm up here, I just wanted to make another announcement. Um, some of you are already aware of this, some not, but over the last year we learned that our accordion partitions in both the multi-purpose room and the fellowship hall are not in compliance with code. Um, you always have to have a 36 inch opening when you ever you enclose a classroom um, you have to have that opening for egress so we've modified our partitions we've used cables to shorten them and so when you go to set up classrooms with those partitions they will no longer fully close when you set them all up so don't try to force them close they won't go close and always try to keep that that's to keep a 36 inch wide opening for egress so um, thank you very much In other words, keep your hands off the partitions. No, 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 no. no. and uh, especially want to thank John Dersher and Jim Bogdanor for their work in modifying that. And um, that was a lot of work, but uh, maybe at some point we'll we'll share. But this was a real answer to prayer, considering just all of the things that happened. So anyway. Uh, I have a couple of announcements. First of all, I'm, I'm supposed to remind you that the chili cook-off is coming in three weeks. Based on the number of people who have signed up so far, I've got a really good chance of winning. Um, so if you want to lessen my chances, then you need to, uh, you need to sign up. So please, uh, we always have a good time, and it's a great time of fellowship. Also, uh, we are continuing to collect uh, baby wipes and diapers for the Columbia Pregnancy Center. So again... Um, if you can remember and purchase some, please bring them. We're going to do this for a couple more weeks in February, so let you know that. And then just I want to throw something out here. We are interested uh, in building a replica of the empty tomb of Jesus to use during the Easter season. So if anyone here has uh, any interest in being a part of this design process or construction process, uh, or if you just have some good advice, let me know, and I'd appreciate that very much. It is good to have you here this morning, and I want to uh, take an opportunity to say hello. So would you stand and greet one another right where you are as we begin to prepare our hearts to worship? Okay, let's sing together. Our first song of the day is Higher Ground. Sing with us.
together. Father, we thank you today for uh, the blessings that are ours in Jesus Christ and for the potential that you have given to us to be transformed into the image of Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that this song would be a reflection of our progress, that we would be moving on and on to higher ground. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. We thank you, Lord, today that he, you made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God through him. Lord, today we are grateful for this privilege of joining our hearts together and to worship you. And Lord, we ask that you will be honored and glorified in all that we do. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. This next song is brand new. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to have you remain standing. It's got four verses. You can listen to us sing the first two verses. And then starting the third verse, come and join us. I'll let you know when to come in. So it's called Yet Not I But Christ Through Me In Me. Wait. Yet Not I But Through Christ In Me. <laughs> yeah. Shepherd will defend me. 
please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Today's reading comes from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. Romans 8, 5 through 13. The power of sanctification, emancipating living. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because of mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And if Christ is in you through the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to the mortal bodies through the spirit who indwells you. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die, but if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have been born again of the Spirit by faith and made spiritually alive in Christ. Thank you that we have the Spirit of the resurrected Lord Jesus living in us. Thank you that although we live in a body of sin which is subject to physical death, we will one day be clothed in the immortal body by faith in Christ Jesus, our God and Savior. I pray, Lord, for this church, this congregation, this ministry, I ask you, Lord, with a healing hand to touch those who are suffering from ailments and to give comfort from those who are suffering from the loss of a loved one. I ask, Lord, prayer for Pastor Steve this morning as he delivers your word. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, let's stand and sing again. Take my life, holiness. Stay with us.
That's a <clears throat> simple song with a very powerful prayer behind it. Lord, uh, what I need is holiness. I want to invite you to take your Bibles and open it to Romans chapter 8. And as we do, I'm going to invite you to pray with me. Lord, we thank you today for your work in our lives and for giving to us Lord, the resources that we need to change. Father, it is an amazing, mind-boggling thing to think that, that you have given to us the very nature of Christ and that, Lord, that you uh, can make us like him. And so today, as we come to your word, I ask that you would open up our minds and our hearts to understand and to receive what it is that your spirit would teach us today. And then having heard and having understood, we pray for the grace to put into practice, Lord, the things you tell us today. I thank you for every person who has gathered together this morning. And Lord, we come before you thanking you for the word of God, thanking you for the truth of the scripture. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the, the inerrancy and the infallibility of your written word, for in it, Lord, we hear you speak. And so, Lord, again today, we ask for grace. In Jesus' name, amen. When a person becomes a Christian, when they are born again or born from above by the Holy Spirit, they become a new person. They get a new life, a Christian life, a spiritual life. The Bible says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. There's uh, an old hymn. And the first verse says, What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. There are some significant observations in this verse about what it means to be in Christ. Christ means that a person is a new creature, or some versions will translate new creation. And what this means is God saves a person and gives them the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. They experience not a renovation, but a regeneration. We're not an improved version of the old self, but we literally become a brand new self. I like the question that J. Philip Arthur asked. He says, what is a Christian? What can we say about somebody who is in Christ? Is he little more than an unbeliever with a kind of moral facelift? Are the differences between saved people and unsaved people merely cosmetic, or do they go deeper? Paul would have us to understand that Christians are not people with one or two superficial changes, but new people altogether. Each one is a new creation. Everything about them is different. Everything is new. We're a new creation. And secondly, old things, those things which characterize the kind of life that a person lives before they come to Christ, have gone. They're passed away, done, over, finished. There is an antidote about St. Augustine, who was one day walking down the street in Milan, Italy, when there was a woman with whom, in his earlier days, he had had an immoral relationship, saw him, and shouted out to him, Augustine, Augustine. He heard her, but ignored her, and continued walking. She apparently followed after him, shouting all the more, Augustine, it is I, it is I. To which he reportedly said, yes, but it is no longer I. Now, there's some debate as to whether this story is actually true or not, and I don't really care because it doesn't change the truth of his answer because it hits the nail on the head of what it means to be a Christian. The Apostle Paul himself would write, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we're a new creature, a new creation. Old things have passed away. And the third thing about this verse is new things have come. What things? Well, certainly there is a newness in our relationship, a newness in our standing with God. 
but there's also to be a newness in the way that we live our lives. We do have a new identity as children of God, but we're also given a new power by the Holy Spirit to live as children of God. A new life of devotion to Christ means that there is to be a difference in the way we live with new attitudes, new actions. Paul's assumption is that being in Christ should bring about a radical change in a person's life. But does being a new creature creature or creation mean that we are instantly changed in every facet of our lives? Do we go to sleep as a worldly caterpillar and wake up as a spiritual butterfly? Let me ask you, when you invited Jesus into your life, did all of your old habits and problems and issues disappear all at once? Probably not. It certainly wasn't my experience. I can still remember shortly after making a commitment to Jesus, going to play miniature golf with some friends of mine. And it's so long ago, I don't remember the details, but I don't remember being particularly frustrated or angry by my play. But after missing the putt on one hole, out of my mouth came a volcano a profanity that was spewing all over the place, much to my own humiliation and embarrassment of my friends. Now, I need to tell you that I, I normally didn't use profanity. That was not characteristic of my speech. It's not because I was, it was a prude. It's simply that I, it wasn't part of my life. I always, have always considered profanity as an indication of limited vocabulary. So you could imagine how surprised I was when this just effortlessly came out from nowhere. And I'm thinking, what happened to old things passed away? <laughs> By the way, that was not the one and only time in my Christian life that I have demonstrated old behavior. And no, there will be no more examples this morning. If old things pass away and new things have come, then why do we, I, still sin? Well, I think the answer is that you and I live in the here and not yet at the same time. The changes that God makes in our lives do not happen all at once. We are all a work in progress. We are all under construction. And that process is that we are becoming or supposed to be becoming like Jesus Christ. Now, is this process of transformation perfect? If old things passed away and new things have come, does that mean we, there will never be a resurgence of old prejudices and old habits and old attitudes and old sins? Well, as someone said, not as long as we're still breathing. But what it does mean to be in Christ is that the general tone of our life, the direction of our conduct, the bent of our behavior are all upward and Godward and heavenward toward the eternal God glorified. Now we've been taking a look at uh, a, 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 an introduction to Christian primer, a Christian primer looking at some basic truths about the Christian life. And this morning uh, we're going to come to a subject that I want us to consider and that is um, temptation and sin. And uh, I think maybe a good starting point would be to just simply talk about a clarification about temptation and sin. Temptation by itself is not the same thing as sin. Temptation can lead you into sin, but being tempted is not necessarily a sin. Last week we were looking at what authentic prayer looks like, and we referenced the disciples' prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And in that, he taught them to pray, forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's interesting that debts or trespasses, depending on which version or sins, requires forgiveness. Temptation needs deliverance. They're not the same thing. Just because you are struggling with a temptation does not mean that you're sinning. I think it's also important to understand 
that the word in the Greek New Testament that's translated temptation is also the word that's translated test or trial. For example, uh, James says, Consider all joy, brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance or patience. James says that when we encounter various trials, which means they come in all colors, shapes and sizes, intensities and durations, we are to consider joy. Why? Because enduring them produces an endurance. And endurance can result in a mature, proven character. The point is that experiencing and enduring trials can be a good thing for your spiritual life. The Gospels record that immediately after his baptism, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Jesus was tempted, the verbal form of the word trials, the noun in James. Are you still with me? Good. So let me ask, did the evil one tempt Jesus to help him spiritually or to hurt him spiritually? And when you read the account of the temptations that the devil used, it's clear that the intent was not to benefit Jesus, but an attempt to get Jesus to sin. So let me reference James again. He goes on to say, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Did you hear that? God does not tempt anyone implied with evil. So herein is the difference between a trial or a test and a temptation. A test is meant to make you spiritually stronger. A temptation is to meant to make you spiritually weaker. David and Goliath was a test of faith that resulted in triumph. David and Bathsheba was a temptation of the flesh that resulted in tragedy. Enduring a trial produces spiritual growth. Yielding to a temptation produces sin. So with that in mind, let's consider the cause of temptation and sin. Cleroy Wilson Jr. was an American comedian, an actor best known for his television appearances in the late 1960s and 70s. You might know him as Flip Wilson. And one of his most popular characters, Geraldine Jones, frequently said, the devil made me do it. Does the devil cause us to sin? Does he indeed make us do it? After all, the Bible calls him the tempter and the accuser of the brethren. And as we've already mentioned, he tempted Jesus when Jesus was in the wilderness. And the evil one certainly blatantly and brashly tempted our original parents in the Garden of Eden. But does the devil make us do it? And if you are quick to agree, then you might be surprised that while the devil does tempt people, listen carefully, he cannot make them sin. The devil cannot make you sin. That's your choice and yours alone. Again, this verse, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. You know what I don't like about that verse? There's no hiding from it. Because it uncovers and exposes our excuses and our blame shifting. Which, by the way, is exactly what the first woman did and the first man did when they were confronted by God because of their sin. Then the Lord God called to the man and said, Who, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? That is a yes or no response. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is, that you, this, what is this that you have done? 
And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Do you see the first human beings playing the blame game? God confronted Adam and Adam's response was, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Listen, the husband is definitely throwing his wife under the bus. But is he blaming her or is he blaming God? The woman you gave me, she gave me from the tree. I think inferred in this statement is, I wouldn't have sinned if you hadn't given her to me. I was fine on my own. She's the problem, and it's all your fault. The woman also shifted the blame because God confronted her, and she said, the devil made me do it. The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And as long, folks, as we blame someone or something else, as long as we refuse to take responsibility for our own actions, as long as we are unwilling to be honest about our sin, I do not know how the change, growth, and maturity occur. And as it relates to the Christian life, I do not know how we become like Jesus. The evil one is a problem, but he's not the problem. Together with the evil world system, they are resolutely determined to take us down. But the greater problem is in us. But each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. Or the New Living Translation says, temptation comes from the lure of our own evil desires. You know, I think Peter understood this when he wrote to believers, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war in your souls. Again, Peter says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything that pertains to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Peter says that we can become or have become partakers of the divine nature. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that believers are little gods or that we are born with a spark of divinity that needs to be unleashed and flamed into godhood. We are complete in Christ, but we are not little gods. God alone is God. What it means is that God's power, which is available to us through Jesus Christ, is not only a saving power, but it's also a living power which energizes us so that we can live holy lives. You've probably heard the phrase before, use it or lose it. I think there's a similar vibe here. God has given you the power to become like Jesus, but if you don't,